Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC140 Human Physiology. This video is the part one video for heart parameters. S3P2, this material is on lecture exam three. So let's get right into it. The cardiovascular system has three main components. So remember, cardiovascular is an anatomical name. Let's break the word down. So cardio, first a heart, vasculature, vessels, so the tubes. So the three main components of the cardiovascular system are the heart, the vessels, and blood, the stuff within the vessels and within the heart. Do you remember the functional name for this system? Do, 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 do. Correct, the circulatory system. All right, so what is the purpose of the cardiovascular system? Well, it's to deliver nutrients and remove waste products. So this is one of the, this is the main highway in our body. This is how we get glucose to our cells. This is how we get oxygen to our cells. This is how we move hormones around. This is how, this is the highway system. It's gonna be moving, uh, ions and vitamins and, and other, all the nutrients, all, pretty much all the nutrients that we need to get to our individual cells within our body. This is the highway system. This is the delivery system for those nutrients. It is also the highway system that helps remove waste products. So carbon dioxide is produced during metabolism. Well, we need to move it around our body, get it to a place where we can remove it from our body. So circulatory system moves carbon dioxide around. Uh, we produce nitrogenous waste. We need, to we need to get that nitrogenous waste from our cells where it is produced to an area that is able to remove it from our body. So the circulatory system moves that waste from where it is produced in the cells of our body to an area where that's able to get rid of it completely out of our body. So removal of waste. Now, humans are considered to be a closed circulatory system. Closed. So what does that mean? All right. So I'm gonna kind of jump ahead and give you a few pieces of information that we talk about further on in this lecture, but the only place where nutrients are able to leave our circulatory system and waste products are able to enter our circulatory system are the capillaries. Capillaries are the most narrow, the tiniest of our different vessels. So we'll talk about the different types of vessels we have later on, but capillaries are the sites. It's the place where things are able to move in and out. Our aorta is an artery. Things are not able to move in and out of our circulatory system at our aorta. Within the heart, nutrients are not able to move in and out of our circulatory system, our, our cardiovascular system inside of our heart, except for in the capillaries within the heart, but within the ventricles they are. Um, within the within the capillaries, within the, the walls of our heart, absolutely they can, um, but pretty much capillaries. The smallest of the tubes, the smallest of the vessels are where nutrients are able to leave the circulatory system and waste products are able to come in. Blood is supposed to stay within the vessels in the heart. Blood is supposed to stay within the cardiovascular system. Humans are a closed system. What is outside the interstitial fluid is different than what's inside our blood. Closed system. Capillaries are the sites of exchange. Capillaries are where things move in and out. But blood stays within. Arthropods and mollusks. Arthropods and mollusks like this grasshopper right here is an arthropod their blood and their interstitial fluid is pretty much, it's, it's one and the same. The heart helps circulate this, this hemolymph is what it's called in sinuses around organs. So their interstitial fluid 
and they're, they have a heart which kind of just moves interstitial fluid around the body. And their interstitial fluid and, and blood is kind of one and the same. It's called hemolymph uh, in sinuses surrounding. So in an open circulatory system, the circulatory system, interstitial fluid, we just kind of move interstitial fluid around and it kind of bathes around the organs. We can compare that to our closed system where we have our circulatory system separate from our interstitial fluid. Uh, this is human physiology, so we will be focusing on our human closed system. But I still think that kind of knowing the other options that are out there, it, it helps you learn, helps you understand it. So right here, uh, this is an annelid worm. So you can see here, we've got a closed circulatory system. Uh, we've got these tubes, which are different than the interstitial fluid. Right here, we have our heart. It moves blood through our arteries, into our capillaries, into our veins, and back to our heart. And it is separate from our interstitial fluid. But these capillaries are where things are able to move in and out. So let's move on. So the heart has four chambers. So this goes back to, there's gonna be a lot of uh, form and function in this next section of this lecture, going all the way back to our first day of class. I told you that we'd be talking about form and function all semester, and here we are many weeks later still talking about it. So the heart has four chambers. Two upper, which are called the atria, and two lower, which are called the ventricles. The right atria is the right atrium, sorry, RA stands for right atrium, LA stands for left atrium. They are receiving chambers, they are thin walled, and they pump nearby down. So they pump to, I'll get back to that in a moment. The lower chambers are the ventricles. Ventricles, so RV for right ventricle, which helps pump blood to the lungs. Left ventricle, uh, LV, helps pump to everything else, so our, our systemic circulatory system, and it is the thickest layer. So I want to take a step back and talk about big picture. What does the heart do? So we know the circulatory system as a whole, its job is to deliver nutrients and move waste. It's the highway system around our body. How does it accomplish that? How do these three components come together to accomplish that? Well, we've already talked about blood, the blood lecture, where we see how blood holds on to these nutrients and, and what's in blood and how blood does its job of being the vessel, the carrying part of it. The heart and the vessel, how do they come together to move blood around our body? Well, the heart generates pressure. Things move from high pressure to low pressure. If you have a soda can and you shake it up and open up the top, if you shake it up, you're going to be building up pressure within that soda can. You open up the can, pressure is going to go from high pressure within the can to low pressure outside the can. Things move from high pressure to low pressure. If you blow up a balloon, you're going to be building up high pressure within the balloon relative to the outside. You let go of the, the opening of the balloon, air is going to move from the high pressure within the balloon to the low pressure outside the balloon. Things move from high pressure to low pressure. The heart is gonna generate pressure. I think the general public generally thinks of the heart as like, like, as like a pusher of blood, and it, it does push blood, it does move blood. But I want you to start really thinking about it in terms of, a, of being a pressure generator. The heart generates pressure and it creates pressure differences, which allows blood to move from high pressure to low pressure. So these atria, so the ventricles are really the big pressure generators. They're the stronger pressure generators. The atria 
their job is to help the ventricles generate large amounts of pressure. So they're thin walled because all their job is to pump blood into the ventricles. The ventricles job is to pump blood to everything else, to generate enough pressure for blood to flow to every other part of the body. The atria just needs to generate enough pressure to have the blood flow into the ventricle. The ventricle needs to generate enough pressure to have the blood flow to the lungs and back and then flow to the rest of our body and back to the heart. All right, so let's do a little more anatomy. Four chambers. So the upper chambers, we have right atria right here, left atria behind this. So right in here, uh, we have the right ventricle here and we have the left ventricle here. So you can see thinner walls of the atria, thicker walls of the ventricles. Now, this left ventricle, you can see, has a lot more muscle than this right ventricle. The right ventricle doesn't need to generate as much pressure. The right ventricle pumps blood to the, the pulmonary circulatory system, which isn't as long. There's not as much resistance, so that doesn't need to generate as much pressure. The left ventricle pumps to, I mean, it pumps blood all the way down to your toes and back. So it needs to generate a higher amount of pressure. So it's, it has thicker walls. I want to go over the flow of blood real quick. Knowing the flow of blood, knowing the, the direction that blood flows, how blood flows is going to help us understand everything else to come and how this works. So we have blood flowing in via our venous system to our right atrium. Blood is then going to flow into our right ventricle. Blood is then going to flow into our pulmonary arteries, into our pulmonary arteries, and it's going to go to the lungs. In the lungs, CO2 is going to leave the bloodstream, and oxygen is going to come into the bloodstream. It's going to leave our pulmonary capillaries, the sites of exchange, and go into our pulmonary veins, which return it to the left atrium of the heart. The left atrium is going to help blood move into our left ventricle. The left ventricle is then going to push blood into our aorta. It's going to cause our aorta to have high pressure so that blood flows from the aorta towards low pressure. It's then going to flow to the rest of our body to our trunk, our brain, our arms, our legs, our toes, everywhere else in our body. Even some back to our heart to nourish our heart, like the, the muscle of the heart, not the chambers. All that blood is then gonna flow back into our veins, which are gonna come back into our right atria. So that's the flow of blood within our bodies. So you can see our four chambers here, right atria, right ventricle, left atria, left ventricle. Right here's another way. So the heart doesn't actually look like the typical heart shape, but here it is again, our four chambers. So these two words you've probably heard of before. There's a good chance you've heard of them before. Systole and diastole. When this is, these are definitely vocab words. When you hear systole, Think contraction. The heart muscle contracts during systole. Systole means the heart muscle is contracting. When the heart muscle is contracting, it's pumping blood out of the heart or out of that chamber. It's moving blood and it's generating pressure. It's generating pressure, so our highest pressure moments are during systole when the muscle is contracting. The relaxation phase, when the heart muscle is relaxed, is called diastole, another vocab word, you need to know this. Diastole is when the heart is relaxed, and it's when blood is moving into that heart chamber. So when the right ventricles in diastole, blood is flowing into the right chamber, and the muscles 
relaxed. It's the low pressure phase. Things flow from high pressure to low pressure. There's low pressure in those chambers, so blood is flowing in. Low pressure diastole. The harder goes a contraction relaxation cycle to pump blood. So the heart contracts, it generates, it does systole, it generates high pressure and blood leaves the heart. It goes into diastole, the muscle relaxes, it generates low pressure in the chamber and blood moves in. Blood flows from high pressure to low pressure. So this is what I've been talking about. Pressure differences dictate the flow of blood. Yes, the heart moves blood, but I want you to really think about pressure. Think about the pressures generated. Pressure differences dictate the flow of blood. Things go from high pressure to low pressure. High pressure to low pressure. Blood flows from high pressure to low pressure. All right, so these numbers right here on this graph to the right are gonna show you the pressure ranges of the different heart chambers. So the right atria, its pressure varies from five to zero. At diastole, it's at zero. At systole, it gets up to five uh, millimeters of mercury pressure. The right ventricle, on average, ranges between zero pressure and 15 pressure. The left atria, zero and five again. The left ventricle, between zero and 120. So now we definitely see why the left ventricle has more muscle, it's thicker than the right ventricle. Um, the right ventricle only needs to get up to about 15 pressure. The left ventricle needs to get all the way up to 120 pressure. So it requires more muscle. So pressure dictates where blood flows. Now, the pressure gradients that are just naturally, that are just already set up within our circulatory system are gonna allow for about two thirds, about two, th so, so the pressure gradients that are set up just in between heartbeats are gonna be such that pressure is, that blood is gonna flow in from the, ve um, the veins into the, into the atria, both right and left atria, and that blood is going to passively flow into the right ventricle or the left ventricle, under the ventricles. So pressure is set up in such a way that it's high in the veins, higher, relatively higher in the veins, going to flow passively, so the pressure gradient is already set up so that blood is going to flow from the veins to the right atria, to the right ventricle during diastole, when the heart is relaxed. The same thing's happening on the left side. There's gonna become a point where about two thirds of the blood, or two thirds of the ventricle is full. So the ventricle's gotten to two thirds of fullness. And at that point, the, the walls of the ventricle are gonna to start to expand a little bit. They're going to start to build up some pressure. And in order to maintain pressure in such a way, the pressure gradients in such a way, that blood will continue to flow into the ventricles until the ventricles are completely full and stretched out, the right atria needs to contract, or the atria need to contract. So two-thirds of the blood is going to flow into the atria and into the ventricle, no extra help, it's already set up. At about two thirds, there's gonna start being a little bit of stretch, a little bit of pressure building up in those ventricles. And so the right, the atria need to contract in order to increase their pressure above what it is in the ventricles and push that extra bit of blood into the ventricles. And so that last one third of filling to the ventricles is gonna be due to active contraction of 
the atria. So it's happening on both sides. The last one third of the filling of the ventricle comes from the contraction of the atria. So let's see, pressure in atria is greater than pressure of ventricle. In order for blood to flow from the atria to the ventricle, it must be true that the pressure in the atria is higher than the pressure in the ventricle because that's how blood flows. Blood flows from high pressure to low pressure. So two thirds passively, one third actively due to the atria contracting. The aorta. Uh, so the aorta, where the left ventricle pumps blood into, this tube right here. The aorta maintains a pressure of about 120 over 80 on average. This reflects the ventricle, left ventricle pressure. So the aorta, will, the pressure in the aorta will get as high as what it is in the left ventricle. The left ventricle is gonna pump it up to 120 pressure. The aorta is kind of like a balloon. You, you fill it up with blood and it stretches and it holds onto that pressure. And then when you let go of the nozzle, it kind of squeezes, it's elastic, and it squeezes back down on that blood and pushes, you know, the balloon pushes air out of the hole. The aorta is gonna start pushing blood through that hole or down through its tubes. And the elasticity is gonna help maintain its pressure or the, the low points at 80. So it blows up to 120, it squeezes down and pushes the blood forward with that elasticity until it gets down to about 80. And then the heart beats again, left ventricle pumps it up to 120, it squeezes down like a balloon, squeezing that blood forward, maintaining that pressure. Uh, to push it forward until it gets down to about 80 pressure and then the heart pumps it up again and then it squeezes down and squeezes down and so on. Uh, that elasticity helps maintain that, that fairly level pressure in the aorta. Um, so that el elasticity helps maintain that fairly level pressure in the aorta. Uh, venous pressure. Uh, it's usually about four to 10 pressure. Uh, it generally reflects arterial pressure. Uh, it's gotta be above zero because things go from high pressure to low pressure. And so if we have zero pressure in our ventricle, um, we've gotta be above that in the venous system so that blood flows from our venous system into our ventricles. Um, but it's gotta be lower than it is you know, in the left ventricle. So low to ensure flow back to the heart. It's gotta be lower than the aorta, but higher than the ventricles. So four to 10 for the venous pressure. So oxygen is exchanged in capillaries. So no oxygen moves in and out of the aorta. No oxygen moves in and out of the vena cava. No oxygen moves in and out of the abdominal aorta. The capillaries are where oxygen moves in and out of the circulatory system. Blood is gonna be pumped out of the left ventricle into the aorta. The aorta is gonna carry it to all of the tissues of our body. And when it, it gets to those tissues, it's gonna have a, a capillary bed. The capillary bed is where uh, oxygen moves in and out, or moves out, and CO2 moves in, nutrients move out, waste products move in. And so as the aorta, pumps blood around our body, it's gonna be saturated with oxygen, around 99% saturation when it moves through those arteries. When it gets into the capillary beds, as we talked about in our blood lecture, some of that oxygen is going to leave the bloodstream. It's gonna leave the blood. And so on average, our blood is gonna get down to about 70% saturated by the time it leaves the capillary beds and goes into our venous system. As it flows in our venous system, it's considered uh, less, it's, it's about 70% saturated with oxygen. It's low saturation of oxygen. And it's gonna flow back to our heart, to our, the right side of our heart. It's gonna go into the atrium and then into our ventricle, our right ventricle. And then our right ventricle is gonna pump it into our pulmonary arteries. Pulmonary arteries have 
around 70% saturated blood. They have lower, uh, relatively low saturation of blood within our pulmonary arteries. Um, I want to point something out. Pulmonary artery, relatively low saturation of blood. The aorta, the systemic arteries, high saturation of blood. Uh, it's really easy to write test questions on that. And you will probably see test questions trying to get you mixed up on that, um, either in my class or in a future class. So just a heads up, pulmonary artery, low oxygen saturation, aorta, systemic arteries, high oxygen saturation. So um, artery is something that takes blood away from the heart and vein is something that takes blood back to the heart. All right, so artery takes blood to, uh, away from the heart towards the lungs, pulmonary arteries. At the pulmonary capillaries, uh, the pulmonary, at the lungs, we're gonna have CO2 leave our bloodstream and oxygen come back into our, um, our circulatory system, to our blood. And so once it goes through these capillaries in the lungs and gets into the pulmonary veins, we're gonna have high oxygen saturation again. High oxygen saturation in pulmonary veins goes back to the left side of the heart to get pumped back into the aorta. So pulmonary veins, high oxygen saturation. Systemic veins, low oxygen saturation. Pulmonary artery, low oxygen saturation. Aorta, other arteries, high oxygen saturation. Heart valves ensure one-way flow in the heart. So, in order to understand valves of the heart, you need to understand pressure and you need to understand the direction that blood is supposed to flow. Blood flows from systemic veins into right atrium, right ventricle, into the pulmonary arteries, into the pulmonary vein, into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and then into the aorta and around our body. We need to maintain pressure in such a way that it's always moving towards low pressure. So high pressure to low pressure. Valves are going to be the valves of our heart. So this is big picture right here, how valves work. If pressure is set up in such a way that blood is gonna flow the direction that we want it to flow, the valves are gonna be open. So if pressure is set up, big picture, we have four valves. We have valves in between our atria and our, and our ventricles, and we have valves between our ventricles and our arteries. So valves between atria and ventricles, valve between atria and ventricle, valve between ventricle and artery. If the pressure is set up at that moment so that blood will flow the way that we want it to flow, the valve is gonna be open. If pressure is set up in such a way that blood is gonna flow in a direction that we do not want it to, the valve is gonna close. Heart valves ensure one-way flow of the heart. Heart valves ensure one-way flow of the heart. If the flow is favorable, valve open. If the flow is gonna be unfavorable, valve closed. All right, so heart valves ensure one-way flow of the heart. So if we have higher pressure in our right atrium than we do in our right ventricle. Blood is flowing from right atrium to right ventricle. We're happy. Valve, tricuspid valve is open. If pressure starts to get above, uh, if pressure is higher in the right ventricle than it is in the right atrium, tricuspid valve closes. So valves are only gonna be open if the pressure is set up in such a way that blood's gonna flow the direction that we want it to. Uh, during ventricular contraction, the AV valve remains closed to prevent 
blood flow backwards into the atria. So during ventricular contraction, ventricular contractions, ventricular systole, our, our ventricle is contracting and generating a high amount of blood of pressure. The left ventricle gets all the way up to 120 pressure. That's high. When this left ventricle contracts, why doesn't the blood start to flow back into the veins? Because the valve closes. When the ventricle contracts, the AV valve, the atrioventricular valve, closes and prevents blood flow. So we have two types of valves. We have AV valves, atrioventricular, which is between the atria and the ventricle. Break the word down, atrioventricular, atria ventricle. And then we have semilunar valves, which are going to be between the ventricles and the, uh, the arteries. All right. So during ventricular contraction, the AV valve clo uh, remains closed to prevent blood flow back into the atria. We are going to talk a lot about valves opening and closing later on. So if it doesn't make complete sense yet, just hang on. It will. All right. So the heart is composed primarily of cardiac muscle. So the heart is mainly muscle. It's 99% muscle. A lot of muscle. And about 1% stuff that holds it together. So when the heart generates pressure, let me take a step back. Big picture. Your heart starts beating before you're born. And it pretty much doesn't stop until the end, right? So your heart might is gonna be beating. It beats while you sleep, it works while you sleep, it works while you're awake, it works while you study physiology. Your heart is always working. And anything that makes its job harder is not gonna be good for your heart. Your heart wants to be as efficient as possible. It's got a big job to do. And when it contracts, it wants to contract in the most efficient way possible. Kind of the analogy that I like is when you're getting toothpaste out of a toothpaste jar, a toothpaste tube, my wife just squeezes the middle of the toothpaste tube. And eventually, you know, you get to that point where like it's tough to get more more toothpaste out, right? Squeezing the middle of the toothpaste tube is fine at the beginning, but eventually it becomes really inefficient. It gets really hard to get the toothpaste out of the tube if you're just squeezing randomly around the tube, right? It's an inefficient, it takes a lot of extra work. Me, and if you wanna be efficient about your toothpaste tube use, you start at the bottom and you kind of roll it up, right? Or you start at the bottom, you kind of slide up, you squeeze it up. That's efficient expulsion of your toothpaste from your toothpaste tube. Your heart wants to be as efficient as possible when it, when it pushes blood out of your heart, into your, into your arteries. It wants to be as efficient as possible. So it wants to you know, be the toothpaste tube where you start at the bottom and work your way up efficiently. Now what my wife does, where she just squeezes the middle of the tube. In order to get all of the cell, I'm going somewhere. In order to get all of the muscle cells within your heart to function together, to work together in the most efficient way, it needs to have a way of communication. It needs to have a way of coordinating the contraction and relaxation of all the different muscle cells within the heart. And your heart, as you've alluded to in the past, has gap junctions. It has direct connection, a direct cytoplasmic connection between heart cells. And this is going to allow for a very coordinated contraction, a very efficient contraction. So these gap junctions are protein channels that connect adjacent cells. They allow the passage of ions and the direct transmission of electrical signals. So when one heart cell contracts, it's able to pass that contraction onto the next heart cell so that we can get a very coordinated contraction of our heart muscle.
gap junctions, protein channels that connect adjacent cells allow direct passage of electrical signals. Gap junctions enable coordinated action of cardiac muscle. So coordinated contraction for efficient pumping of blood, efficient generating of generation of pressure. Syncytium. Syncytium is a vocab word, underline it, make a flashcard, is a network of interconnected cells. You can see here that heart muscle cells kind of have, they're, they're tube-like, but also not. You know, they kind of have these different branches and they can connect with a few different other heart cells. All of these that you see here, these representations with the squiggly lines are intercalated discs and that's where the gap junctions are. These intercalated discs are connections between adjacent uh, cardiac muscle cells um, have gap junctions. They have direct cytoplasmic connections, which allow for a coordinated systole contraction phase, but also for a coordinated diastole coordinated relaxation phase. Uh, it's not good when the coordination uh, of your heart muscle is thrown off. So syncytium, a network of interconnected cells. Here again, you can see this connection of interconnected cells. Perfect. All right, so another thing that helps us coordinate this contraction are the septa. So septa separate heart chambers. Septa separate heart chambers. A septa is a tissue that divides the heart chambers. So vocab word again, there's gonna be a few vocab words on this page, make flashcards. So a septa is a tissue that divides heart chambers. We have interatrial and interventricular septa. So interatrial between the atria. That one's found between the atria. Interventricular between the ventricles, found between the ventricles. These allow electrical signals to pass through. These allow signals to be passed through these intercalated discs, these gap junctions. So a contraction can start in the right atria and spread through the interatrial septa to the left atria. Interatrial and interventricular septa allow for these gap junctions, allow for the passage of these electrical signals. The atrioventricular, so break the word down, atrio refers to atria, ventricular refers to ventricle, so between the atria and the ventricles, this one right here, does not allow signals to be passed. It does not allow for gap junctions. It does not allow for the electrical signals that pass from the atria to the ventricles. It prevents it. Electrical signals can travel within the atria, so one atria to the next atria, and within ventricles, so one ventricle to the next ventricle, but not between ventricles and atria. Um, there's a special way, which we'll talk about soon, how the electrical signal passes through. All right, so we've mentioned this before in this class too. We've actually seen it with the frog lab. There's autorhythmic cells within the heart. Autorhythmic cells can spontaneously generate their own action potential, their own muscle action potentials. There's three main types of nodes. So all these autorhythmic cells are found in the nodes, the cardiac nodes. There's the senoatrial S or SA node. There's the atrioventricular or AV node. Um, know the long term and the, the abbreviation. Um, you'll see both of these commonly. And then there's ventricular nodes. What do I mean by autorhythmacy? So the cells in these nodes, without any outside stimulus, will reach action potential, muscle action potential, and contract at a given frequency, at a frequency. Now, outside forces can affect these frequencies, so parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system signals, 
or hormones can affect that frequency, but there's a, a set, there's a frequency, a variable free, a frequency that it will reach that muscle action potential and contract and then relax. And then a certain time later, contract and relax at a certain rhythm. It's got an auto rhythm. The SA node sets the basic pattern. So the SA node up here is the one that sets the basic pattern. So electrical signals are passed via gap junctions to coordinate the contraction, and they're gonna start at this SA node. They're gonna start at this SA node. So the SA node is going to contract just spontaneously. It does it by itself automatically. When the SA node contracts, it's going to pass that contraction. It's going to pass that muscle action potential to its neighboring cells through those gap junctions, through those intercalated discs which contain gap junctions. So the purple in this diagram is going to um, signify the contraction and that, uh, or the, the electrical movement. And you can see here that it spreads through the right atria and it also spreads through the interventricular septa into the left atria, right atria and left atria. So there's a contraction that starts up here at the top and spreads downward and pushes blood into those ventricles, pushes blood from the atria down into these ventricles. That electrical signal is not able to go through the atrial ventricular septa, it's going to go, well, we'll discuss this briefly, but it's going to be able to travel through these special fibers down to the apex of the heart, down to the apex of the heart, and then out through the rest of the ventricles. So cardiac nodes have a different inherent rate. So each one of these nodes has their own inherent rate, which again, it can be changed by outside forces, hormones, and such. The SA node, its inherent rate is 70 to 100 beats per minute. A V node, 40 to 50 beats per minute. Ventricular node, V node, uh, 20 to 30 beats per minute. The fastest node sets the speed for all cardiac muscles. So the SA is known as the pacemaker, the rate maker for heart rate. Overdrive suppression is a term that says the fastest node inhibits the lower nodes. So SA node beats at 70 to 100 beats per minute or contracts, starts, you know, starts this, this muscle contraction, this heart contraction, 70 to 80 beats per minute. As that muscle action potential spreads through the atria, it's gonna get to the AV node, which causes the AV node to depolarize, to, to have the muscle action potential. And it's gonna do that at a faster rate. So the AV rate is really just gonna match the SA net one. The SA hyperpolarizes the AV, AV and V nodes. The fastest node is gonna be the one that really sets the rate. Multiple nodes allow for backup systems. So as long as the SA node is healthy, the AV node is still gonna just have its muscle action potential when that muscle action potential comes from the uh, SA node, and its inherent rate is not really going to play an important role. Same with the ventricular nodes. If there's a situation where the SA node becomes deficient, it stops working, it becomes broken, if that tissue dies for some reason, the heart will actually start beating at the AV node's rate, and the AV node will cause overdrive suppression on the ventricular nodes. Pretty interesting. So ventriculars can be in, uh, ventricles can be impatient. Um, you can have premature ventricular contraction, PVC, uh, where the ventricle beats early. And this shortens the time the ventricle has to fill with blood. So the ventricle is gonna contract just fine but there's gonna be less blood within the ventricle, so it's gonna pump less blood out of the ventricle. And if you're not pumping as much blood out of the ventricle, you're gonna to have to pump, you're gonna to have to have more beats. It's gonna decrease the efficiency of the heart. And you know, I mentioned this earlier, 
And your heart has a big job. It starts beating before you're born and it stops beating at the end. And anything that makes your heart work harder is not gonna be good long-term. So premature ventricular contraction, it's, it decreases the efficiency of your heart. It's not gonna be good long-term. Um, caused by reduced SA node firing, lack of overdrive suppression, stimulant, caffeine, and cocaine, a uh, low heart rate. Sometimes your heart rate's so low that it can, it can lead to premature ventricular contraction. So anything that decreases the efficiency of your heart is not gonna be, uh, it might not be good short-term, but it definitely isn't gonna be good long-term. Heart ranges can vary widely. We saw this in lab our first week of school. Um, below 60 is considered bradycardia. That's a vocab word. Definitely know this word right here. Bradycardia could be uh, a normal thing. It could be because of if you just have a slow SA node. It could be of a very active parasympathetic nervous system. It could be because you're really athletic and you have a really large stroke volume. Stroke volume is the amount of blood that you push out of your heart, uh, part of your ventricle per contraction. We'll get into that later. Um, that'll be a vocab word. Um, but we'll, we'll have it defined and really go into it later on. Um, or it could be a disease. So these top two, genetic exercise, normal, where bradycardia might be a fine thing. Uh, you also see bradycardia sometimes in a disease state, and it's not a good thing. Normal uh, is around 60 to 100. Anything above 100 is considered tachycardia. All right, so I'm going to stop part one right there, and we're going to pick up part two on this next slide next time. So as always, if you have any questions, please email me. If there's any way I can help you, please let me know, and I'll see you in the next video.